He is such a fountain of light that if we look Godwards, if we look at him, we are blinded by this light and we see only darkness around us. This is what St. Gregory of Nisa says about him. But on the other hand, as we have seen, God calls into existence whole world, being fullness of exalting joy, of exalting life, of an immensity of knowledge and understanding, he chooses to share it with beings that do not exist before. And this is an act by which he expresses the fact that he, he is love itself. That is, that he wants to give all he has and indeed all he is to other beings. Because the fullness of life is so wonderful. And this is what Loskin expressed so well when he spoke of the energies of God by saying <coughs> that God is completing himself and yet he is and lives and acts beyond himself. His word of creation is not simply a command to be. It is not even a call of love. His word of creation is, is himself giving himself to a world that it does not yet exist. And he pours into this world his energies of life. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit broods over the newly created world, bringing out by its warmth, its light, its power of life, bringing out all the potentialities of a world which to begin with is what the Bible calls chaos. Not disorder, but the sum total of all the potentialities that can evolve into beauty, harmony, and order. And in that sense, one of the fathers, and I think it's again St. Gregory, of Nisa says that the Father creates the world with two hands. The Word, His Son, and the Holy Spirit, His breath. The Word understood as the total, perfect, expression of all that the Father is to the extent to which it can be heard, understood, and shared by his creatures. And the Spirit being the power of life, the power that allows all the potentialities to unfold, to grow, and to become all that the world can be. As an image, I reminded you 
that certain writers spoke of the energies of God in the terms which we can use about the sun. The sun, as you and the, the luminary in the sky, is unknowable to us. No one can be or become what the sun is. But we share in his nature, yes, in his very nature, by his wounds in his light. We participate in the light and we participate in the wounds and thereby we know him really, not as an object distant from us, but as something shared with us. Now, we have seen how God created a whole material world, and I do not have, want to come back to what I have already said. But we have come to a point at which something quite new is going to happen. What is new is that God goes into existence the human being. But not as a last term of a gradual evolution from lesser perfection into greater perfection. I'm not arguing now for or against the theory of evolution. I'm simply saying that we do not see man emerging as a more perfect animal after the creation of the sixth, of the fifth day. What we see is that God, in order to create man, takes the dust, the earth, the basic substance of the created world. Thereby, he makes his new creature, man, akin not only to the more evolved beings that preceded him immediately, but to all the beings that were created. Because it is out of this very dust that was born the light and the earth and the sea and the sky and everything. And man is thereby akin to everything that God has created. He is not a superior being in the sense of being alien to them, having outgrown or, um, what they were. He is at the very root of their being. He is what they are in their essential simplicity. And God takes this to create man. And this has got an immense significance for us in our Christian faith. Because when God becomes man, takes on flesh and breath and spirit. Because he is man, he is akin to every creature of the world. He is akin to the smallest atom in the greatest galaxy. He is akin to every living being to everything that is. And therefore, his incarnation is an event that touches everything that exists directly, not from the outside, but from the inside. When God becomes man in Christ, all creation can look at him, at his humanity, and recognize itself brought 
to total, ultimate greatness and perfection. Looking at Christ, every being that was called into existence by God, every one single being can say that is what I am called to be in my materiality as matter or as spirit. This has also a very important implication in the realm of sorry, in the realm of the sacraments because the sacraments are not elements of the created world that are taken away from its very nature. On the contrary, whether it is water in baptism, whether it is oil, whether it is bread, whether it is wine, whether, whatever is a material support for the sacramental life is what the whole world is called to be when God shall be all in all, when the whole world will be more than the vesture of God. It will be a revelation in matter of God himself, although God will always remain the ultimate mystery, the Holy One. And in that sense, when we speak of holiness in Hebrew terms or in modern terms, what we mean that he is, that God is inaccessible. He is beyond everything and everyone. But he is not distant. He is like the pervading warmth, like the enlightening light like love cherishing, that wisdom penetrating us, <coughs> that communion. And also, in the same line, we must look at the world in which we live, if you want, in modern terms, in ecological terms, and realize that all this world is sacred by vocation and that the way in which man has enslaved it to evil by his own fault, and to that we will come later, is our responsibility. And we are called to redeem this world from this tragic situation and Paul says, the whole creation groans in the expectation of the revelations of the children of God. And St. Theodore, the student, answering a question on that line, says that the world is not evil, the world is not in a state of rebellion against God or against its own vocation. The world is like a good courser, a good horse, which is ridden by a drunken horseman. Our vocation was to bring this world into a fullness of communion with God. But to do this, we had to achieve this communion and we have failed. And this brings me to the creation of man as we read it in the book of Genesis. God takes 
the basic substance of the world and fashions out of it humanity. I'm using the word humanity because the word man in English is a definition of gender and it is not of that which we are speaking in Russian, in Greek, in German there are words to speak of the human being as a whole человек in Russian, mensch in German, anthropos in Greek and what God creates at that moment is the anthropos, the mensch, the человек, the total human being And this human being is endowed with several gifts from the first moment. The first thing is that he is created in the image of God. The second thing is that God, creating him, breathes into him his own breath. From the first moment, man is not only endowed with the general gift of being which belongs to the whole world, he is endowed with a kinship with his creator. Nothing more is said about it, so we cannot describe or define this kinship, but it's a kinship that is established. And we hear that man is created in the image of God. What does it mean? The thing is that we have no image for God. He is the unknowable. He is the ultimate mystery. In a way, as I have already said, he is impenetrable darkness. So it cannot be a revelation as a portrait is. What is it then? The writers of old and of all times have asked themselves this question and a number of answers have been given. I'm not learned enough to give you several of them. I will just take one line which to me makes sense. God creates man akin to himself and St. Gregory Palamas draws on this one conclusion. That God, that man is also a creator. Creativeness is one of the elements of his likeness to God. <clears throat> but there is here a difference between God as a creator and the creativeness of man. God creates out of naught. In other words, he goes into being what was not there at all. Man is creative, but he, is cre he creates out of what God has already provided. My knowledge of ancient languages has grown terribly thin, but I remember Lovsky speaking to me about the creation and saying that God creates, to use Greek words, of the bare own, the radical absence, <coughs> while man creates out of the up own, which is a practical non-existence. I think this is a very real difference. And man is called 
to be a creator, to a creator after God. In what way? He is called, and we have very unfortunate translations in all languages. He is called to have dominion over all that God has brought into existence. And by dominion we understand in our human, limited and harsh terms, being a master and a boss, to be in command. But if you think, I'm not going to go into a variety of languages, but simply on the root in Latin of the word dominion, dominus. Dominus is not one who dominates. Dominus is a master. Dominus is a teacher. Dominus is a guide. And that makes a great deal of difference because we are not called to overpower and subdue the world in which we live. We are called to understand it at the same depth as God reveals it to us and guide it to its own fullness to become itself in the fullest sense of the word. You may say that a distorted, a sinful and evil world or a human being in the same terms is also itself. No, it isn't. It is a distorted self. And we are free to choose, yes. But we are called to a freedom which perhaps can be defined by the Russian word svoboda, which the Russian theologian and cavalry officer Chemikov uh, defines as, from the Slavonic, as the ability to be perfectly, truly one's, oneself. This is a remarkable thing. Man is called to be himself, but at the same time, to belong totally, because he's dust, to the whole creation. And because God has breathed his own breath into him, to be akin to him, to the point which St. Paul describes when he speaks of the day that will come when we will know God as he knows us by total communion when God will be in us and we in him there still will remain the holiness of God, the mystery of God. But to whatever extent we can participate in what he is, we shall. And through us, the whole creation was called to participate. And it is our responsibility that the whole thing has gone wrong. We are responsible for the catastrophe of creation. But there is something more we can derive from this likeness of man with God. There is a mysterious phrase in the beginning of Genesis which has an echo later in the story of Abraham. Throughout the scriptures, God is called Elohim, which is a plural. 
it's not a singular term. And yet, this plural speaks to us of the one God. Because God is beyond the arithmetic one as he is beyond multiplicity. We will have to come to see more into this mystery when we speak of Christ and the descent of the Holy Spirit. I am moving at the moment a pace with the biblical story because it is important for us to see the mystery unfold before us and within us. There is in the story of Abraham a very mysterious moment when he are together with his family camping near Mamre by a very ancient oak. And while he's there, three persons come. It is three men, but from the story it appears that there are much more than simple passers-by who wanted hospitality. They speak to him, the three together, and the three together speak in the first person singular. And already in ancient times, the question was asked, and I have read in a passage of Hebrew literature, which I cannot recollect at present, which I am searching in vain, that at that moment God revealed himself through these passers-by, through his messengers, through these angels as Trinity, as one in three persons. The three persons were present there and one voice spoke, in unison as it were, the three spoke to him. And this is, of course, you, you know, the root of the Rublov icon of the Holy Trinity. The three angels round a table on which there is a, a vessel with a slain lamb. But to this we will come later. For the moment, there is a sort of inkling, an indication, a whisper, that it is not a question of grammar. It is probably not simply that the writers of, the Gen of Genesis were writing in the terms of the pagan world in which they lived. They were speaking of something much greater than the pagan world could understand. They knew multiplicity. They did not know oneness in three. We will come later to this question of God one in three persons when we'll come to speak of Christ or the Holy Spirit of the Church, of the Father. But for the moment, this is already something which is given in the first chapter of Genesis as a revelation of that moment. We understand it in a way in which it could not be understood when the book was written or even later. But there it is. In a nutshell, the whole mystery. But then, if that be true, 
What about this human being, this anthropos? Is it a male? Or what is he? A number of ancient fathers of the church have spoken of it differently, in a way that convinces me, and which I will convey to you as I can. They spoke of it in by saying that in the same way in which the rest of the world was chaos, that is, the sum total of all potentialities, man created was simultaneously the full, the, all the potentialities that could develop and unfold of the two genders of male and female. And the Bible says he created men, male and female, he created them, him. So, here we are, confronted with a being who holds within himself all the potentialities of femininity and masculinity. <coughs> He's not the one or the other yet. And what happens next? is the creation of Eve. I will be very brief on that because I want to come back to it in greater detail. Man is alone, this anthropos, in a world in which every single being has got a companion. All other beings are male and female, and he is alone with, within himself, all the brooding potentialities, and none separated from the other. And God brings to him all the created animals, and commands him to give them their names. I will come to this question of names in a second. I want to say first that this is a moment when man is confronted con with conscious of the fact that all this is the only one who is alone. Everyone has a companion. And at that moment, when he becomes aware of his aloneness, when he longs no longer to be alone, God acts and brings into existence in. The translations which we have of the Bible, whether it is the Alexandrian translation from the Hebrew that was made a hundred years before Christ and therefore is not influenced either pro or against Christianity, or the other translations from the Hebrew and also interpreting the, the text, place us in front of a phrase in English uh, which is confusing. Let us create a helper, a help meet for him. And immediately the thought comes, all right, a subordinate being that will be useful to him. And indeed, even someone so intelligent and so holy as St. John Chrysostom stumbles on that, because he says, well, isn't that obvious then that Eve was created to bear children? Because if it was a question of working the garden of paradise, 
in other men would have been a great deal more useful. Well, it isn't that. The translation is unsatisfactory. I have got several translations, German and French and uh, other, that are very interesting in the fact that they don't speak of a helper. Ultimately, the sharpest translation is, let us create, or fashion is the word used, someone, one, who will be able to stand face to face with him. And this rejoins the passage at the end of the chapter, when Eve is born of Adam, and Adam looks at her and says, at last, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And the English translation in this uh, place is in a way incomprehensible in the sense that it says she will be called woman because she is taken out of man. In Hebrew the words are ish and isha. One could not as a translation but as imagining what it means, see it as Adam look at Eve and saying, this is my alter ego. It is my other myself. And Eve would say the same about Adam. It is herself. It is himself. But place face to face with him or with her. It is a wonderful passage in which we see this birth of Eve. And to, at this point, in, I may be, have to go beyond the three minutes I have. Um, at this moment, it's so interesting to say what it says. We see in most translations that God brought a, a deep sleep upon Adam and then took one of his ribs, fashioned out of it Eve, and then they met face to face. For one thing, the word rib and the word side are akin to one another in more than one language. Say, to use the French, Côte and Côté. And in ancient languages, very often, to speak of a side, one spoke of the ribs, for instance, instead of saying he used to sleep on his side, he slept on his ribs, that you find in scores of lives of saints. So, it is a division, not a piece of Adam, that is, afterwards fashioned into Eve. It is half of the original Anthropos, which is objectivated, placed face to face with him, so that they can be face to face with one another and recognize themselves in the other and the other as themselves. And another thing which strikes me in translations is that we speak all, they speak always of the deep sleep which God brought upon Adam. Although, although despite of the fact that the Greek text does not use the word sleep, it uses the word ecstasy. And there is an enormous difference between ecstasy and slumber. To fall asleep means to become unconscious to become alien to oneself, to become unaware of everything else. Ecstasy is a situation in which one is beyond oneself, outgrows oneself, is more than self. And at that moment, when Adam was, by the help, with the help of God, become more than the self he was a moment ago, Eve emerges. And the two potentialities of 
femininity and masculinity are face to face. And St. Um, Methodius of Patara says that they looked at one another and they said, this is my alter ego, my other myself. Both said the same thing. But it came out of ecstasy, out of being beyond and above oneself, and not of falling down to the level of unconsciousness. And I think this again is something that speaks of the relationship between men and women, between Adam and Eve, in terms which <coughs> we must remember when we'll come to, uh, to look at what men and women are. I would like to say one last word, it will not be too long, about something to which I have no chance to return conveniently. All animals are brought to Adam for him to give them their names. Well, in our fallen world, names do not really say much. You know how we all receive names which we share with others. We know how we speak of the dogs, the cats, or the elephants. It's not names that define a being. Well, in Hebrew thought, in ancient thought, the name was a way of encapsulating in one sound all the substance of an existing being. The name and the person was co-dimensional. They belong together. They were one in the same thing. And you can find in the revelation of St. John, a passage in which we are told that at the end of time, every one of us will learn his name, a name which no one but God knows and he or she who receives him. Because this is a name that is coextensive, identical with the very person, the very being. And so, when Adam, who was then in communion with oneness with God, to the extent to which he could be, because he was still uh, moving from, shall we say, we'll come to that, infancy to maturity, he saw them as God saw them, and he could name them. But he did not name them either elephant or horse, but gave them a name which defined the very substance, the very being, the essence. And it's, that is the moment when he sees that he is alone, not because he hasn't got Eve or someone else there, but because his name is no name. Adam means dust. It's not a name for a being that is intensely alive in God. <laughs> he has no name yet. He can be described as dust, yes, as non-entity is a sum total of all infinite potentialities, but he has no name that is the dynamic power within him. And this is the moment when he becomes aware of being the only one who is nothing. He exists. He is participant to 
all the substance of the whole world, yes, he is participant by communion to whatever degree he can already share it with the breath of God, yes, and yet he has no name. And that is the moment when he becomes so intensely aware. And when he meets Eve, he doesn't call her Eve. Eve is a word that, from what I know from dictionary, comes from the Hebrew word for life. She's not yet life in that sense. He is as much life as she is. She becomes life when she bears a child. But at that point, he's faced with himself, and yet, in her, he sees himself beyond the limitations of self. And she sees in him herself indeed, but beyond the limitation of self. <coughs> I will end with a children's story. There is a short, a little poem. I read it in Russian, but it may be anything, in which it says, I knock at thy door, open, and the voice answers, and who are you? But it's me. I don't know you. How can you not know me? No, I don't know you. Then there is a silence, and then the voice outside says, I understand. Open to me. I'm you. And at that moment, the door can be opened. Well, I will end my talk at this point. Um, there are probably things which I have left unsaid, or rather, intentionally not touched upon. It is the seventh day when God rested of his works. And this is a very important phrase and in a very important day because a number of the ancient writers say that the seventh day, which is the day of God's repose, is a day of man's creative activity. But to this will come. I apologize again that I'm not up to answer questions or to have discussion today. <laughs>